evening. Welcome to ITV News Tag Teams. Tonight's headlines. The Prime Minister faces tough questions at the COVID inquiry as bereaved families gather to hear his evidence. I'm absolutely exasperated, to be fair, because he hasn't given us anything. Um, but the majority of the time he couldn't remember or couldn't recall, but when it was in his favour, he could remember succinctly dates and facts. Keeping up, the cold new figures show parts of our region are hot spots for poor insulation. Also tonight, we'll find out how festive cheer is bringing a financial boost this Christmas. And centre stage for Sunderland, our Fritz found the city will host the opening game of the Women's Rugby World Cup in 2025. First tonight, lives are more important than money. The words screamed at the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak as he arrived to give evidence to the COVID inquiry today. Much of the focus was on the Eat Out to Help Out scheme introduced by the North Yorkshire MP when he was Chancellor during the pandemic. He told the COVID inquiry the idea was to support the hard hit hospitality sector and protect workers from job losses. During the launch of the now controversial scheme in 2020, Mr Sunak visited the market town of Stokesley to speak to business owners. Our reporter, Chris Jepson, has been back to Stokesley today from where he sent us this report. The Prime Minister today arriving at the COVID inquiry met by the bereaved families who shared what they think of his headline policy in the summer of 2020. His Eat Out to Help Out scheme, he told the inquiry, was aimed at protecting jobs as well as boosting the economy. My primary concern was protecting millions of jobs of particularly vulnerable people who worked in this industry. All the data, all the evidence, all the polling, all the input from those companies suggested that unless we did something, many of those jobs would have been at risk with devastating consequences for those people and their families. The former chief scientific advisor has already told the inquiry, I think it would have been very obvious to anyone that this inevitably would cause an increase in transmission risk. And I think that would have been known by ministers. Rishi Sunak claimed the scientists didn't share those concerns at the time. There was plenty of opportunity for people to have raised it, either with me or with the prime minister. I don't recall, and the minutes do not suggest, that it was raised at all in the three precise meetings that you mentioned. People working in this restaurant in his constituency at the time benefited from the policy. It was a very difficult time um, for the Eat Out to Help Out with the um, social distancing rules that were put in place, make customers feel safe. Uh, and the plus side for us in the industry, the industry at whole, was the immediate cash flow positive effect it had. When you hear scientists say in the inquiry that at the time infections rose as a consequence of the Eat Out to Help Out, what do you say to that with hindsight? I think that um, personally uh, the responsible people in the industry adhered to the guidelines, uh, made customers feel safe. His customers had mixed views over the policy that led to an increase in mixing. For businesses, yes, because I definitely think businesses obviously needed income, they've been out of work for a long time, it maybe brought new customers in, so from a business perspective, yeah. With hindsight suggesting, I think at the time thought it was fantastic, he got people back out and uh, and the people felt they needed that at the time, but perhaps the reality is looking back with hindsight is that in fact it did open up people to a lot more exposure than perhaps uh, had been intended. For businesses like this one, without the Eat Out to Help Out policy, they may not have survived COVID. But for the families who lost loved ones, lives should have been put ahead of jobs. Chris Jepson, ITV News, Stokesley. Well, our political correspondent Tom Sheldrick is live at Westminster now. Tom, an extremely tricky couple of days for the Prime Minister. 
It's great, first of all, that a full day of questioning over the pandemic. Rishi Sunak's record as Chancellor during that time was once a, sor a source of strength, but he's clearly now on the defensive over Eat Out to help out uh, particularly. I think he succeeded today, not causing any more controversy, but his evidence also brought about frustration for many uh, bereaved family members attending the inquiry, like Deborah Doyle, whose mother Sylvia died in a care home in Sunderland in April 2020. I asked her at lunchtime what she'd made of the Prime Minister's testimony. I'm absolutely exasperated, to be fair, because he hasn't given us anything. Um, the majority of the time he couldn't remember or couldn't recall, but when he was in his favour, he could remember succinctly dates and facts. And again, the missing mobile phone, it just doesn't wash with me. Where's that evidence? We need that evidence. That was a reference at the end there to how Rishi Sunak said that he doesn't have access to his WhatsApp messages from 2020 after changing uh, phones several times. Now, the bereaved families group said today that he'd failed during the pandemic and should resign as prime minister. I think that's unlikely to get much traction, but there is a real threat to his future in Downing Street for a different reason. Tonight, Conservative MPs are in open rebellion over the government's planned new legislation to try to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda. There is a, a, a high stakes vote coming tomorrow night on that flagship immigration policy. So certainly no time for Rishi Sunak to relax. On with the latest from Westminster there. Thank you. Police are investigating after an unexplained death of a baby in Bishop Auckland. Officers were called to an address on Dixon Street at around 10 a.m. yesterday, along with paramedics, but the baby died at the scene. And they are now looking into the circumstances surrounding the death. West Brom Champion Football Club says it's assisting police after being told about a hateful social media post about Sunderland fan Bradley Lowry, the six-year-old, was hugely involved in the club before he died from a rare form of cancer in 2017. West Brom say they've suspended the fan who made the post and have apologised to Bradley. A financial advisor from Sal Shields, who stole nearly £2 million by offering fake investment plans, has been jailed. Stephen Ray defrauded 16 different clients, two of which got in contact with Durham Police after investing six figure sums for seeing no return and after Ray stopped replying to their calls. When police raided his house, they found a range of luxury cars, including an Aston Martin Vanquish. He was sentenced to seven years in prison. Next, new research has revealed the parts of the UK where homes are in greatest need of improved insulation. It comes as many households face another difficult winter with soaring energy bills. In a moment, we'll be talking to the people behind the research, but first, Kevin Ashford reports on why home insulation can be vital to keeping the bills down and how poor insulation can hit hardest for those on low incomes. Underneath the cardboard is a layer of thermal insulation lock. Nigel Cleal has been busy at his home that he shares with his teenage son. When ITV News filmed with him last year, Nigel had begun insulating his flat with cardboard because he says the landlord hadn't carried out the work and his energy bills were rocketing. It's hard and I've been hard because I've only got one wage coming in and then I've got a 13 year old lad, they're not cheap to run. Um, and I have to, every month, look at the money to see what's going out and if I can reduce the energy prices. Uh, I can't have a flat which is cold because I'm eating the lab. At the time, the fire service warned of possible safety concerns over the use of cardboard, but Nigel says he's since been given the all-clear following an inspection of his work. According to the consumer campaign body Wish, the UK housing stock is amongst the oldest and leakiest in Europe. But the organisation has just revealed where action is needed most, what it calls its insulation priority places. One area that's been given one of the higher need ratings of 9 out of 10 is Sunderland, which says properties there tend to have very poor levels of roof insulation. There are a lot of older flats, and there are very high levels of fuel poverty. Staff at this insulation firm in Chester Street in County Durham say having insulation work done can make a big difference. We've been at a loss for everything, none at all. Absolutely none at all. All laps and plaster, all the ceilings, um, and the heating bills have been through the roof. So 
when we come in, we're top of the three hundred mil. I've said, listen, in three months, give us a ring and see if you've seen her, and, and it's took a third. In some cases, not all cases, but a third of her of the gas bill. In a statement, the government said it has recently launched its Great British Insulation Scheme, helping families in lower council tax bands with less energy efficient homes to keep their homes warm and save money on their bills. These bills are set to rise next month for millions of households after the industry regulator Ofgem announced an increase in the energy price cap, making the issue of savings through insulation even more critical. Kevin Ashford, FTV News. Well, we're seeing here clearly a massive worry right now with energy prices so expensive. And earlier I caught up with Grace Borrell, from which the organisation that carried out that research and began by asking her just how hard poor insulation is hitting homes and pockets in our part of the world. Grace, thanks for joining us. We've heard there how much this issue affects parts of our region like Sunderland, but just how much of an impact would you say this is having on people's homes and their pockets? Well, I mean, if you have a poorly insulated home, it means that you're, you're losing heat and you're going to be paying a lot more to heat it. And the price of energy has uh, doubled over the last two years. So it really pushes up those costs. And then aside from the financial impact it has, um, if you are elderly, if you have respiratory or cardiovascular problems, these can be aggravated by living in a home that is drafty. So it causes all sorts of problems not having a, a properly insulated home. So how easy is it then and how expensive is it to do something about this and get your home properly insulated? It really varies. I mean, there are cheap things that you can do yourself, like um, draft proofing your windows um, around your doors and keyholes. Then, you know, you've got sort of roof, floor, loft. I mean, these can stretch into many, many hundreds of pounds. Um, they will save you money in the long run, but the initial investment, it can be quite high. Yeah, on that, there will be people understandably saying to themselves, I can barely pay my bills and it is. How am I supposed to find any spare cash to do something like a big loft insulation project? In other words, it's a vicious circle. Is there any way of breaking it if you are on a low income? Well, there are various schemes. So there's the, the Great British Insulation Scheme. There's also um, the Eco Scheme, which is the um, energy company obligation. So if you're in receipt of certain benefits, if you live in a house with um, a low energy efficiency rating, a, in a, a low council tax band, you might be eligible for these schemes. So it's worth um, looking into that, definitely. And we're not just talking about something that impacts people's finances or their comfort. There's environmental benefits to this too. Yes, I mean, the need to address climate change it increases with each year that passes. And so we simply cannot afford to have poorly insulated homes and um, that the levels of insulation are falling well below what they should be at the moment. Briefly, before we leave you, the number one bit of advice you could give to people, the one thing that pretty much anybody you could do, could do, would you say? So I would say if you have a combi boiler, turning it down to 60 degrees, and if you can afford to, turning your thermostat down, um, even just by one degree, can shave about 10% off your heating bills. 10%, that's a big number, Grace. Many thanks for your time. Thank you. You're watching live some of the most tight years still to come on tonight's programme. Simon will join us. We'll look back at the weekend sports and members of the middle for squad have spread some festive cheer. And mostly dry today, rain tomorrow, but how's the rest of the week looking? Join me later to find out. Well, last year, it's estimated nearly 600,000 visitors to the York Christmas market spent a total of £81 million. It's more than just mulled wine, mince pies, and the local festive produce that's for sale. It is a big economic boost to one of our major cities. Need some big numbers, and we're told that this year, despite the cost of living crisis, new research is suggesting Christmas markets are still popular, as Catherine Walker's been finding out at the York Christmas market. The shutters are open and the stalls are lined with stocking fillers. Christmas market season is back and the festive cheer is spreading to businesses in York hoping for a slice of the action. I mean we love it here, this will be our fourth year I think. York is just so festive this time of year anyway and it's so nice for us to meet so many people that come to York because you find that it's not just locals that come to the market, there's so many people that visit here for this market in particular. 
So just a bit of brand awareness for us, like showing people our good local products is great. The first German style Christmas market came to the UK in 1982 and was an instant hit. Fast forward 40 years and festive markets like this have become a permanent fixture in our Christmas calendars with more than 100 across the country. Hi, how are you? For event managers like Sarah, it's a chance to showcase independent traders bringing much needed money into the local economy. I really like the Christmas market because it's full of local produce and lots of different products that people can't get on the normal high street. So they come and buy something unique for Christmas for their relatives and friends. So it's absolutely critical that we put on things like the Christmas market to keep the high street alive. You can see all these people coming in, spending money. And despite the cost of living crisis, Retail expert Catherine agrees that Christmas markets are still proving popular. People want to do things at Christmas. They want to celebrate. They want to have some fun, get that Christmassy feeling. And we know this year over 40% of families in the UK have planned to visit something like this or a Christmas event near where they live. And I think even though it's tough and, and finances for families is hard, we will have Christmas ruined. And lots of people have saved up the money across the year, little bits of money to spend right now. And with plenty of fun on offer, shoppers here in York have been making the most of the festivities. I've really enjoyed all the Christmas lights and all the food stalls. We bought some churros and some fudge and just the spirit and the rates and all the taste of the things. <laughs> I just love uh, like the semi variety with these other shops. It's a bit of everything. So. Well, honestly, I think the Christmas market are nice. They're nice. Like, all, the, all the lights and stuff are really cool. Like, <laughs> nice chocolates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whether it's mulled wine or mince pies, the German market is full of Christmas classics. And for many families across the country, it seems it's still the perfect place to celebrate the most wonderful time of the year. Catherine Walker, ITV News. And the evening news continues after us tonight at 6.30 with Mary. Program. The Prime Minister tells bereaved families he is deeply sorry as he gives evidence at the COVID inquiry. He defended Boris Johnson and denied government dysfunction. But why were his WhatsApp messages missing from evidence? We'll have all the details. Mary Lineker thinks about the government's Rwanda policy. Why the Defence Secretary puts such a kickback to himself? And the unlikely accent dubbed the sexiest by an A-lister. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Time's here for the sport now on a weekend where it was bad times for Newcastle United and the Borough, but Sunderland's caretaker got off too friendly out of fly. <laughs> Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. So Sunderland's search for a new boss continues, but Simon, they do seem to be in safe hands in the meantime. Yes, the caretaker took care of business in his first match. The Black Hats win over West Bromwich Albion was just what the club and caretaker Mike Dodds needed and got Sunderland fans being all festive. There was less Christmas cheer in evidence at the Riverside on Saturday as Middlesbrough lost at home to Ipswich, but they made up for that today. It's all about the championship promotion race for Borough this season, but today was just champion. This is the club's champion children's Christmas party. The VIPs on this guest list are kids who've made a special effort in difficult circumstances, whether it's in the family or in the community. They were the stars of this Riverside fixture. <laughs> it's so nice, obviously, to see obviously the kids here and how happy they are, and when you all look here and how happy they are to see you, I think. Yeah, it, it puts a smile on your face, obviously putting a smile on their face is the most important thing. You don't understand what some of these people go through and um, also the support they give us is, is our match, so you've got to give, give a bit back for sure. Unfortunately, Saturday's Riverside fixture didn't go to plan. Ipswich are the unexpected promotion party team, and they added another three points to their promotion push. It just wasn't for a day. Ask Emmanuel Latte La, who didn't have his shooting boots two days ago, but did have the smile back on his face today. Ipswich won 2-0 and Barrow have dropped to 12th in the championship table. He just played against a good team and, and, and it shows that the, the kind of um, competition and the levels within the league that we've got to be at our best. What do you want for Christmas? <laughs> um, I haven't even got a list. 
football wise, we've got some important games coming. Wales, obviously, from a professional point of view, and uh, spending some time with the family is always important as well. Mike Dodds, previous fellow Sunderland caretaker back in the League One days, didn't go well, but he was full of confidence this time, and that was well founded. The Black Hats were excellent against West Brom. They would have been ahead by half time, but for a dreadful offside decision against Joe Bellingham. But they weren't meant to do fine second half goals. Dan Bellard's excellent header and Dan Neal's cool finish. Would you like some salt on those chips, sir? There was a build back for West Brom, but that wasn't going to spoil the caretaker's day. But what I am really proud of is when you do make those tactical tweaks in the game, in particular the second half, the players adapted. And I think sometimes when you make those tweaks, and I keep saying to the players, you've got to be all in on it. You've got to be completely all in, no black or white. And it's, if we fail, we fail through sticking to a plan. Um, so in terms of, to, to answer your question, in terms of being proud, what I'm really proud of is we had to make some changes and tweaks to, to the original plan. Um, and I think the second half performance was a Sunderland team, in my opinion. This suggested Tony Mowbray's departure was to do with relationships, not football, because this wasn't a broken team. They finished the day back in the playoff places, and Mike Dodds is set to be in charge again at home to Leeds tomorrow night. Michael Cohen needs to get my on his list for Father Christmas, doesn't he? I've got to think for that. Salt on his chips, that's what it is. Yeah, more, more salt on the chips. Uh, moving on from all of that, the Champions League then looms large for Newcastle United this week, Simon. Um, make a great game against Milan on Wednesday, but they're not really going into that in the best of form, are they? They're not. They suffered their second heavy defeat on the road in the space of four days. Four on Spurs yesterday. Now, I don't think it's a case of the wheels coming off, more in terms of not actually having enough wheels. Uh, it's the injury situation. They're still decimated by injuries. They named the same 10 outfield players for the fifth game in a row, and the truth is, it's all getting too much for them at the moment. They've run out of energy, they are struggling to cope, and Spurs took full advantage of that situation, just as Everton did last Thursday night. Now, it didn't help that Spurs' one true world-class player, Son Kyung Min, did yesterday to play an absolute blinder, but that is life in the Premier League. It also doesn't help that the Magpies away record this season is actually really bad, and that can't all be put down to injuries. And to add insult to all the injuries, Newcastle fans had to battle train cancellations and replacement bus services to even get to the game. So it was quite an act of faith that the Toon Army still gave their team a hero's reception at the end. Yeah, two really tough trips for them, but I think hopefully they can see the players are giving everything that they have physically. There's some tired bodies there, there's players playing with injuries. Um, but we really are grateful for their reaction, we're really thankful for their understanding of the situation that we're in. Harrogate's game at Sutton in League 2 was off because of a waterlogged pitch, and we had three winners and two losers in the Women's FA Cup third round. Newcastle United were 5-0 winners over Stoke City in a game played at Gateshead International Stadium. Sunderland and Durham also got through. Sunderland beat Durham Sestria 7-0. Chesley Street were also knocked out. The draw for the fourth round is tomorrow morning. It's not just Newcastle United in European action this week. The Eagles are flying out to Romania to take on CSO Voluntari in the European North Basketball League. Unfortunately, they go there on the back of Friday night's home defeat to Bristol Flyers. And speaking of Europe, the Falcons played well in their European Challenge Cup opener against Montpellier, but the French side won by 24 points to 19. <laughs> Simon. Alex tonight, it promises to be the biggest event in women's rugby that the world has ever seen. And it's all going to start right here in our region. Yeah, what about this then? Sunderland Stadium of Lights will host the opening match of the 2025 Women's Rugby World Cup, with the Red Roses themselves kicking off the tournament. Former England captain and North East Rugby royalty Sarah Hunter was there to help announce the news, and she says it will help to inspire the next generation. It's Tom Johnston reports. Festival of Rugby is coming, and Wearside is ready. Sutherland's Stadium of Lights will raise the curtain on the 2025 Women's Rugby World Cup. And who better to share that good news than Rugby Union's very own Angel of the North, Sarah Hunter. It just means everything to, to have a home World Cup and having the Rugby World Cup come to the North East, come to Sutherland, and the magnitude of the, the Stadium of Lights, but then for it to be the Red Roses playing on the opening game of Rugby World Cup 2025, it's just so special. Like, I get like hands in the back of my neck on it when we talk about it, you know, uh, bringing an amazing sport like ours to, to the region is, yeah, so special. 
As a player so led by example with the Red Roses, she retired earlier this year as the most cut England player of all time. Now she gets to watch her legacy unfold from the touchline. That in some respects, like you'd love to play in here, but it's been great to see how the game has moved forward. And whilst I might be too old to, to run out with my boots and, and take part, I've got a role within the Red Roses in the coach capacity now, so I have some way and play a, a small part to maybe helping some of the players be the best they can be, that they can like shine on this stage. The tournament will be the next step in growing the women's game in England, and it's building on good progress. The number of registered players has almost doubled since 2017, with more than 40,000 women and girls now taking part. The RFU hopes to more than double that figure by the end of 2027. With more teams and more venues, organisers promise this will be the biggest celebration of the sport the world has ever seen. It's about visibility. If you can see it, you can be it. You know, if you're if you're if you're a woman and girl looking, you know looking to get into sport, you see what's happening on the pitch, you know, you see those role models and you think that, you know, that's also for me, that, you know, there's some opportunity there for me to, to be involved as well and that's what this is all about, inspiring those women and girls to, to, to pick up a ball, to play, to be involved. So come August 2025, it'll be Howie the Lattice at the Stadium of Light. With the tournament being played in England, you could argue rugby's already coming home, but the Red Roses will be doing their level best to keep it here. Tom Johnston, ITV News. So exciting, isn't yeah. it? They're starting right here in our region, just really great, really yeah. lovely. And that is here with weather now. Amanda, I've got a great one for fashion, but I think the umbrella is the <laughs> must-have fashion accessory. It's essential. That has been the statement over the last few days, hasn't it? Yeah. It certainly has been soggy out there. Just a bit of context. Durham overall for the whole of this and being through this season around 93 millimetres of rain on average. It's already high. It's 69 millimetres, so 75 percent of what it should have had. Amazing. Already, exactly. But that hasn't stopped our lovely viewers getting out and about across the region, taking a look. You can see in gates. Like, look at that lovely soggy street with the lights really making it look gorgeous. But as you say, it's just rained literally on and off. Thanks to Sheila for sending that into us. We've also had some beautiful sunrises. Just look at the colours there. Isn't that absolutely stunning? And finally, we'll end up a little bit of wildlife, some lovely deer here, just getting us into the Christmas spirit. But although it's certainly not been feeling very Christmassy out there today, in fact, more mild than cold with the forecast. Record highs forecasted. Two weeks sponsors, ITV, Time Teams Weather. Hello again. So after a pretty grotty weekend for many of us without breaks of rain at times, things certainly poked up for many of us throughout today. Lovely blue skies here, big thanks to Tom Lee for some of that picture into us. Now looking ahead towards the next few days, we're still expecting some more rain as we go through tonight and into tomorrow. But the good news is totally much drier as the week continues. It will be remaining on the mild side too. So at the moment then dry out there, but we have got this area of low pressure, it's pushing another system towards us as we go through tonight and into tomorrow. And that rain falling on already saturated ground may lead to further issues of localised flooding too. And then you can see there will be a little bit more rain as we go into Wednesday and Thursday. But other than that, for many of us, a good deal of dry weather out there. And hopefully we'll get to see more in the way of sunshine too. Now in the meantime, out there at the moment, well it's fairly quiet, it's dry, it's cold, we've got clear skies, but then overnight that cloud will start to increase and eventually you can see here this rain will be moving its way across us, some of that heavy and persistent in places too, and that means for tomorrow morning, not the best start to the day on Tuesday, so a lot of cloud around at first, outbreaks of rain, and as I say, that rain may lead to a few more impacts across the region with some localised flooding. It does eventually move out of the way, but you can see behind it, we're left with a lot of murkiness, some low cloud, one or two showers, and those winds will pick up for a time too. Temperature-wise, they're well above average for the time of year, that is, we're looking at highs there of seven or eight degrees. And looking at further ahead, as I said before, there will be a little bit of rain to start with on Thursday, but then for many of us, dry as we edge towards the weekend, and staying on the mild side. Bye-bye. Two weeks sponsors, ITV, Time Tees Weather. Amanda, I think I'll carry on building an arc for the uh, time being. The national and international <laughs> news is up next. I'll be back here with a late update at 11 tonight. From all of us here, take care, have a great evening. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.